program to this third honor symposium on our theme, Finding Middle Ground in an Age of Certainty. And today, our speaker is Andrew Wall, who yeah, uh, has been here since 2013 and runs our journalism and media communications program and is advisor to the Clipper. Uh, he actually is an Everett Community College graduate. He got his AA here, so. Yay! Right. Go Trojans! Um, he has a BA in Liberal Studies from UW Bockel with a focus on American Studies and International Interactions. And then he went uh, to Kansas, to Fort Hayes University, where he finished a Master's in Liberal Studies with an emphasis in the Humanities. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Andrew Wall. Hey everyone. Thanks, Chris. All right. First off, show of hands, how many people are here for Joyce's class? Good, good. How many people are here from one of my classes? And specifically, my online CMST class. Excellent. Those of you who I haven't met before, make sure to come up and say hi afterwards. I love to put names and faces together with my online students. So um, today we are going to be talking about the filter bubble, rethinking news and community in the age of social media. And I'm hoping that I've got just the right amount of content to last this hour. First time I try a lecture out, there's almost always four hours worth of material that I cram in here and then have to edit. So hopefully we've got this about right. And I want to uh, start off by defining uh, our, the term filter bubble here. How many, show of hands, how many people have heard of the filter bubble before? All right, so the, the phrase really was kind of coined and explored um, by Eli uh, Pariser. Uh, in 2011, he wrote a book about the filter bubble. And so this is uh, his TED Talk from 2011 that will uh, kind of provide context for what we're going to be talking about today. OK, so there are th three components that go into the filter bubble. And the, the first one being that kind of algorithmic uh, thing that, that um, Paris is talking about. This notion that you've got these outside gatekeepers that put together this algorithm that make it so when we look at Google, we all see different things. Um, it is really noticeable when you're in other places. For instance, if you try to type democracy into a search engine in China, you're going to get a very different set of results than anywhere here in the United States. So that algorithm is an outside factor. But what plays into that algorithm? Well, you've got a couple of components that you're contributing. And the, the first one there is the device you're using. So any graphic students in the class or here? So responsive design uh, is a type of internet design that is responsive to the device you're viewing it in. And so how many of you access Canvas via a mobile device at some point? Would you say it is as robust as experience if you're using the computer? No, there is flat out. There is certain types of feedback that I put on assignments that you cannot view on a phone. You can view it on the iPad, but not on the phone. It took me a year and a half to figure out why my students uh, were not responding to my feedback. Well, it's because the primary device that they were using was their phone. It wasn't actually until my daughter uh, took uh, is a student here now, and I came home and she's sitting in a, a chair in our living room and she's kind of upside down, her little thumbs are going 90 miles an hour. I was like, what, the, what are you doing? She said, I'm writing a text or a term paper on her phone. <laughs> this is how students are interacting with Canvas, and I don't think teachers understand that until they see that technology in place. So each device is accessing the same pool of information. Doesn't matter if I'm on a browser on the desktop or if I'm on a browser on my phone and uh, on a mobile website or again if I'm using an app. So that design factor also limits what you're doing. And then finally is the personal curation. And that's actually the biggest thing that they're talking about, the you in there. We all decide where we are getting our information flows from. And so who we follow uh, is that starting point. And well, eventually, and, and what the video was talking about, is sometimes if, if I'm overwhelmingly clicking on progressive websites and I'm talking to my liberal friends, it doesn't matter, ultimately, if I have those kind of viewpoints. The algorithm might strip it out because it knows I like, I lean in this other direction. But if you're, they're not there to start with, it's even worse. And so making sure that you are uh, self-curating, that you are, when you're going to Facebook, the, the things that you're like, that you're looking at a range of things, a range of uh, opinions, people who don't think like you do, will get you a richer report. Same thing goes on Twitter, anywhere you go online. Um, 
and it's everywhere all over the internet. It's also in how we shop. I don't know, how many people have bought something off of Amazon? I mean, all of us at this point. It used to be I'd ask this, it's amazing how more hands go up, and now it's just we all shop there. But of course, that whole home page is customized. So my next question, how many people have bought something off of Amazon because all of a sudden it pops up on the home page and you're like, oh my god, I need that? Any impulse buys? Well, OK, I might be the only one in the class that does impulse buys. I would say on the home page of Amazon, either every item on there I either already own or I want to own. That's how good the algorithm is. I'm a comic book geek, and it knows my tastes to a cue. Um, and so that's the power. That's the invested interest that Amazon has. The better they personalize that content, the more likely they are to be able to monetize it. The same thing goes with Facebook. If they know who you are, they can sell advertising. Just an article came out this morning, uh, 1.8 billion Facebook users now and record growth in their advertising. And they can sell targeted advertising, which is why they are growing the way that they are. All right, so the filter bubble really starts in the mid-1990s with the rise of the World Wide Web. Let me actually carry these because i got some dates to share here. So the World Wide Web starts in 1991, and in 1995, Yahoo is the first big news portal out there. And that was one of the ones they mentioned there, that they start, all of a sudden Yahoo starts to learn who you are, starts collecting information, starts dropping cookies on your computer to allow it to follow what kind of searches you're doing. It's like, a, a, it's amazing um, the way your life changes. Uh, you All of a sudden things will start popping up. My dad passed away last November. Within a day of that happening, all of a sudden the Google ads that started popping up on the sidebar were about cremation services. Um, that's how quick it is to respond to that personalization. Uh, Google starts in 1998, and Google uh, brought that kind of targeted content. That was another step up in the game. But things don't really explode with the filter bubble till the mid-2000s. So in 2007, what happens? The, the crash comes in 2008. Good, good guess there. What else? What happened in 2007? Right there. This is what makes social media and the filter bubble explode. Prior to this, so you, you saw MySpace start in 2003, Facebook starts in 2004, YouTube starts in 2005, Twitter starts in 2006. And as somebody who was there working in newsrooms, using it as journalism, it was a, a fun little curiosity. It was fun to play with. It was fun to communicate with people. But what we, how we interact with social media today starts in earnest in 2007. We get explosive growth in social media when we can be plugged in 24-7, when our, we are never unplugged. How many of you, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is check your, one of your feeds? Yeah, I mean, first thing I do, if my alarm goes off, I hit snooze on my phone, and it turns on, and I immediately, for me, it's email first, because email was the first social medium that my, you know, my generation came, so yay, people are emailing me, Twitter's next. And then after I consume that, it's like, oh, breakfast, you know, use the bathroom. I don't, I mean, I'm not using the bathroom. I'm checking my feed. It's the first thing that you do. And so that, that explodes. And from, for, to let you know how much, in 2005, 5% of Americans were on social media. By 2015, that number is roughly 70%. That's according to the Pew Research Center. And it's across the board. Uh, 18 to 29 year olds are the, the most robust users of social media. Fastest growth population right now for social media, that would be your grandparents. And that's why also younger people have left Facebook in droves because their grandparents are there now. And they are on Snapchat. Um, you'll see people move between social media depending on the demographic there. All right. So in this filter bubble, um, we, we get uh, isolated in, in different ways, and it has had major, major impact on both news, and the way it has impacted news, I would argue, has impacted our very sense of community, and really has contributed to this kind of acrimonious, divisive world that we live in today. Uh, red states and blue states, I, I think, are a byproduct of the direction media has traveled. And so the first question I want to ask is, what impact uh, did it have on the news? And so again, since I am arguing that your cell phones or your mobile devices are, were the cause of this, I want everybody to get out your phone. And if you don't have a phone, partner up with somebody sitting next to you because I want everybody to play along. And again, 
Well, no, no, no. Seriously, YouTube, I'm done with you. Go away. I'm going to shut you down. All right. Not bad. I'm going to go over to here. Okay. So we're going to do a little interactive poll. How many people have done interactive polls in class before? I'm a grizzly veteran of this. I've done it exactly one time about an hour ago with my guinea pigs in J110. So thank you to them. Uh, on your phone, you can either go to a mobile browser and go to pollev.com slash tandrewwall558. Or if you prefer, uh, you can text message tandrewwall558 as the keyword to 37607. And after you do that, you'll join the conversation. You'll be able to answer this question. Where did you get your news this morning? Where did you get your news? A couple minutes for the results to pop up here. Again, in case people can't see the type up there, it's T. Andrew Wall with an H558. Yeah, this is a really nice uh, tool. Normally, it's like, show of hands. And it's like, no, let's actually get words up on the board here. So. So as these are popping up and moving across here, you can definitely see right away um, the two leading contenders here are, are we've got Facebook and we've got Twitter here. And those are 100% curated collections of material with that algorithmic component at play. Those are filter bubble enforced pieces of media that you're taking in. Um, so so if everybody stop that for a second and I, I, I want to uh, I'm going to reset this here, and I want to explain something. Uh, let's see, is that my clear button there? Clear poll results. No, for real, clear the poll results. There we go. Okay. So Facebook and Twitter in media communications are not sources of news. Think of Facebook and Twitter as a Xerox machine. The source of news is the writing in the book, and I put it on the Xerox machine, and I make copies, and I share it. So when you're looking at Facebook and Twitter, where is that information coming from? Is it coming from Como? Is it coming from the Seattle Times? Is it coming from a friend? Uh, is, it, is it word of mouth? Uh, is it a legitimate source? So if you know your specific place that your news is coming from, and if you've got multiples, send, go ahead and send a couple multiples. Give me the specific sources of news um, that, you're, that you are experiencing today. Yeah, you betcha. So, so Facebook and Twitter don't produce content. They, they do some content. But for the most part, they are just repurposing other people's content. I put something out there. So when I like an article from Como on Facebook, Como is the actual source of that article. So what is the source of news that you have? NPR, and it could be you heard about something from a friend. And that is a perfectly acceptable source of news. I'm just trying to get a sense of what these sources look like. And so pretty, pretty soon as these are popping up here, you're starting to see a pretty wide range of sources of news. Uh, if you're looking at places like uh, Fox News, you're looking at something that by definition has an ideological slant. It is a right-leaning news organization by design. MSNBC is a left-leaning news organization by design. That's part of their marketing strategy. CNN. Their, their uh, place in the media universe is they want to be a traditional balanced news source. Unfortunately, I think for CNN sometimes, they try too hard at it. They go out and get three Republicans and three Democrats, put them in a room screaming at each other and call it news. Um, I don't know that they always do the best job, but they try. So that, those are kind of all traditional news sources. Um, I see the stranger up there. Then you start getting into some, some of the stuff in here like BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed's another one kind of like Facebook. Uh, there is Buzz, BuzzFeed News. In fact, one of the articles I'm using in my talk today was reported by the BuzzFeed News staff and is what I would consider a legitimate source. Um, but a lot of stuff on BuzzFeed is stuff that is reader submitted or reader promoted. And that same kind of filter bubble is at play there. 
Um, same thing goes with the Huffington Post. They have gotten to be more of a legit news uh, organization over the years. Again, I would say left, definitely left-leaning. But their original strategy was what they called the mullet strategy. All business, or business up front, party in the back. The first few pages of Huffington Post were well-reported, well-researched traditional journalism. But the deeper you clicked into the site, the more crazy reader-submitted content, what we today would call fake news, would show up. One of the first stories that really got branded, we did, again didn't use the language fake news, that's kind of a, the, the uh, word de jour for 2017, but af right after Katrina, a story went up live on Huffington Post, and again it was a reader-submitted piece deeper on the site, that said it had gotten so bad on the streets in New Orleans that people were resorting to eating corpses. The AP, the Associated Press, again a traditional news organization, picked up that story and cited the Huffington Post as their source and it went international. Within an hour, it was proven that that was a fake news story and the Huffington Post printed a retraction and backed back off of that. But by that point, the damage was done. It was already out there. People still today talk about that as an event that actually happened. It did not. So all of these sources, uh, there, there's a wide range of sources up there. The other component to this, how many of you today read news from the Everett Herald? So three, four, four hands went up. If I asked this same question 20 years ago, if I would have asked, this question would have been asked for a group when I was a student here, almost every hand in the room would have went up. And what that meant as a community is that we had a shared group of facts. And the, agree or disagree with those facts, we had a starting point for conversation. There is no shortage of reading going on today. There is no shortage of news consumption going on. Look at all of this news that was consumed today. But depending on your perspective and the filter bubble you've built for yourself, we all enter this room now, sometimes with actual different facts at play as well. All right, so let me go to the next question up here is I want to ask. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So do you, do you recommend any Yeah, um, one, one of the things I always look for is human curation because again, like Pariser was saying, journalism ethics aren't perfect by any means. Journalists are human and, and flawed creatures. But they are trained to look for balance, they're trained to vet. So like during the, the uh, political season, realclearpolitics.com is a wonderful, wonderful site. Started years ago by two lawyers. Um, they present every day two curated batches of stories from across the web and they tend to go from the almost to so the far right but not extreme to the far left but not extreme. They don't get out of the crazy fringy stuff, but you get this wide range of what would be considered mainstream opinions. Often, you know, and, and again, uh, but it's all curated and vetted, and that that's something that's like I can get a sense of what people who don't think like me think from those pieces. So that that's one of those places that I go. But that kind of human curation, particularly when the mission of an organization is to bring diverse people together to talk. Those are our good sources. Of the news sources up there, I still think NPR does a phenomenal job of, of doing traditional journalism and getting out into places. And then uh, localized, um, particularly locally owned newspapers, still have the most boots on the ground and are responsive to a particular community. Now, does the Seattle, uh, or does the Seattle Times have a left-leaning bias? Of course because they are serving an audience that voted 80% blue in this last election, but they are covering the range of the Seattle experience. So that kind of local ownership is another component that I always look for. All right, so where do, so, uh, where do Americans get their news? So we saw a lot of online on that. I just wanted to jump into this and kind of answer that question. I think it's page two here. This is the latest, new, uh, latest report from Pew on how Americans are getting their news. This is how, as a whole, uh, the channels that we are using to get our news. 57% are still going to TV. Again, that means something different today than it did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, Pre-CNN, pre the 24-7 news cycle where we had these 24-hour news stations, we checked in with our local news. So we got ABC, NBC, or CBS, and we would get a half hour of national news, and then we would get half hour of local news. And again, it was very much like reading the Herald. We had that shared experience together. Now, 
we are all going out to news that tends to reaffirm our already held world positions. So it's like I go to CNN because I consider myself, I, politically I would consider myself to be center left. I, I, I'm moderately on the left side of the spectrum. Um, so CNN, uh, and again a hardcore journalist, so it's like I'm looking for that balance. I can watch MSNBC and I tend to agree with more of their speakers and I can tolerate that. I watch Fox in limited doses because it feels like my values are under assault. So this TV experience is very different because there is a filter bubble component there where we select which channel and get a very different prism. And now you see uh, online now is 38%. And we definitely saw that with this particular group. Uh, if you break down further into this report, younger people, Facebook and Twitter, far and away the two largest. Uh, Snapchat is actually gaining as a source of news as well. Uh, but Facebook being the, the biggest single uh, contributor to news. So what does this mean when we are getting our news from a place like Facebook? Well, in this last election, what we saw is fake news all of a sudden gets delivered. And, and I, I asked the question, where do we get our news uh, from my journalism class earlier today? And the first one, they're all like, oh, I got it from Facebook. And you know, that was the leading contender. And I said, what was the source? The number one source for that class was, I really don't know. You know mm -hmm. Unknown was what it was. And that all of a sudden, it's like, oh. Well, so was that report, was it giving me news that was vetted? Because your local newspaper, it used to be very simple. You put 50 cents in the paper box, and so you were buying news judgment. People who had gone to college, been trained, they apply news judgment. You know, is there proximity? Is there prominence? You know, why are we re putting this piece into our newspaper? That's what you were buying. But now, all of this is being presented in this you know, garden hose of information that we get every morning, and so we walk away. So it leads to um, perceptions that uh, are very, very different between people depending on the kind of news they read. And so what I want to do next, and I want everybody to get your phones out again. Go to my next question here. <coughs> Activate that, okay. And so I have got this, and, I, and I'm going to be, by the way, I will send out a bibliography to all of my classes, and Joyce, I'll send it to you as well to share with, with the other students, that are all, all the articles and all the source material that I, I brought together for this. But there was a wonderful story in the Washington Post, and it was called, Americans, especially, but not exclusively, Trump voters, believe crazy wrong things. And it went through and it asked, it got focus groups together and it asked them specific things where there is a demonstrative, factual pile of information. It's like, we know the facts. There's vetted science. There's a consensus that this information is true or not. And then it asked these groups of people statements and asked, do you believe this or not? So I want this group here. Do, uh, do you think the following statement is true or not? President Obama was born in Kenya, true or false? And this group is uh, pretty extreme. I actually should have asked the question first here, who you supported in the election. I forgot to add that one. That would have been a nice piece of context here as well. Um, this one here, scroll down here. So the answer to this one. So if you were asking this to a group of Hillary Clinton voters, pretty pretty close to this. 89% said yes, uh, or, or said that no, Hillary Clinton, or Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton was born in Kenya, um, <laughs> said that Barack Obama was not born in Kenya. Only 11% thought that definitely or probably not. You flip that around, you look at Trump supporters, 48% said that he wasn't born in Kenya, 52% said that he was. So this was a persistent myth, um, absolutely, across the board, categorically, this group gets it right. This is a really easy one for journalists. You go to where he said he was born, Hawaii, you file a public records request, the uh, local office produces the birth certificate, you look at it, done. That's a, it's super easy. So when he, this, this myth first came up at, when he was running, journalists from organizations across the news spectrum quickly went and did that, and all the legitimate news organizations like, okay, this is a done argument, this is just dumb. But persistently, throughout uh, Obama's uh, administration, all eight years, between 15 and 20 percent of Americans continue to believe this. Um, and, and that's one of those things. And, and again, 
this is, is not just one side or the other. It comes to do with what kind of information. If every day I am getting emails or I'm getting things in my, in my uh, Twitter feed or my Facebook feed that are reaffirming this, of course I'm going to give it some credence. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. All right, this statement here, millions of illegal votes were cast in our most recent presidential election. True or false? Okay, this one's got a little bit more, a um, little bit more going on here. So again, with the body of evidence, here, if I ask the same question, whoops, that's the wrong one. If I ask the same question to Hillary Clinton supporters, 75% would say that it is definitely or probably not true. 25% would say it was true. That it flips almost completely around if you ask Trump supporters. 38% would say that this was true or probably true, and 68% would say, or actually, 68% said that it will probably was true. So 70% of Donald Trump's supporters believe this. Currently, President Trump believes this as well. So what does the body of facts say for this? Again, traditional journalists from across the political spectrum, this is a really easy story to do. You go talk to the secretaries of states at the local level at all 50 states. And across the political spectrum, and, and these are elected positions. So you know, here in Washington state, we have a, Demo a Democrat in that position, I think. I don't know that for sure. Is there a Republican here? Um, and for, for years it was Ralph Monroe, and he, and he was a longtime Republican. Um, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a position, a partisan position. Across the board, all 50 Secretary of State in the United States say, we do not have widespread election fraud in this country. Yet, this is still a, a thing that is out there, and you see it every day. My feed generates this as well. And, and again, my, my feed, I intentionally have this curated feed where I'm getting a wide range of perspectives, so I do see this popping up pretty regularly. All right. Whoops. There we go. All right. Uh, another statement. Russia hacked the email of Democrats in order to increase the chance Donald Trump would win the presidential election. Let's see here. And so this one, and this one I think is, the, the, the numbers are probably a little different now, even than in December when this was asked. But if you ask this same question to Hillary Clinton supporters, 87% would say that it probably is true. 13% would say no. And if you ask Donald Trump supporters, 80% would say that it's not true, and 20% would say it was true. Right now, the intelligence would suggest um, that there, the, the, uh, the intelligence absolutely knows for a fact that it was Russians that hacked the Democratic servers. I think the, the hinkier part is we still are determining is it, were they trying to get one outcome or the other. I think that was a little more disputable, but the hacking portion of it is not. <coughs> and then the last one of these. So this one gets us kind of out of the realm of current politics, do you think the following statement is true or not? Vaccines have been shown to cause autism. And so again, um, here, this, uh, I, I think the, this particular group's in line with the, f uh, pretty much in line with the facts, but there is widespread uh, differences of opinion on this. The overwhelming preponderance of science says that no, there is not a connection between vaccines. And whatever possible connection that there might be, that there, the outbreaks of disease related to not vaccinating far, far worse. But this continues to be something that's out there. And if you ask Hillary Clinton supporters, 50-50 split on this statement. If you ask Donald Trump supporters, 92% say that it's true no, I'm sorry, 90, ah, say it's not true, 9% say that it is true. 
And so, but again, I, 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 the, the fact that 50% that of, of Hillary Clinton supporters believe this too, there's a huge body of information that's out there being delivered by feeds that counters what vetted science is saying right now. All right. So I think that was the last of these. No, there's one more. All right. Do you think the proportion of persons without insurance has increased or decreased in the past five years? Health insurance? Yep, health insurance. Do you think that the proportion of persons without insurance has increased or decreased? All right. So we were saying about 70% decrease, roughly 30% increased. Um, if you ask Hillary Clinton supporters, 61% said decrease. 18% said or stayed the same, and 21% said increase. If you ask Donald Trump supporters, 29% or 26% said decrease, 37 said stayed the same, 37% said increased. We are at historic lows for the rate of number of people without insurance. 20 million additional people were added to the insurance rolls. So for whatever other problems that there are with the Affordable Care Act, uh, it did get more people insured. But the facts out there, that's not the perception. That, and there are so many people on both sides of the political spectrum that have what we call skin in the game. There's money to be made on both sides arguing about this. And so there's a lot of misinformation that's available out there right now. So looking at um, these wide range of opinions, how, how does that play out um, when you get uh, somebody in office? Let me pull up. Where, nope, not, 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 uh, there we go. Where does Donald Trump get his news? And so we have a president right now who is a, a break with tradition in a couple of ways. And we've seen it very robustly. For those on that are supporters of Donald Trump, they elected him to go to Washington and do things in a very different way, to shake up the status quo. And I would say that most people who are supporters of Donald Trump think that he is doing a hell of a job right now. He has gone to Washington, and he is he moving the meter in ways that we haven't seen in a long time. For people who were either supporters of Hillary Clinton or part of the Never Trump movement, it, that first couple weeks of the presidency is scary as hell um, because he's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He's go going in there and changing the culture there. So one of the things that has come up and been widely reported is that Donald Trump tends to shoot from his gut. He doesn't like the morning uh, daily briefing. So the intelligence community gets together. One of the first things the president does in the morning is his advisors will come in and will advise him on the latest national intelligence and what's going on around the world, what are the hot spots, what problems might arise. And the president takes all of this in. And a good leader, uh, or I shouldn't say a good leader, a, traditionally a leader that is trying to do a good job will surround themselves by a range of opinions. You want to be comfortable hearing things that you don't agree with. You want that wide, you don't want to be in a filter bubble, you want this to be exposed to this wide range of ideas. But Trump doesn't want that. He, he, he's a straight shooter and he, you know, that's, you know, that's what he ran on. I'm a straight shooter, I go with my gut, I'm going to do what I think is right. So where is he getting his information if he's not listening to a group of, of uh, intelligence experts? So BuzzFeed News went through, and they went through a couple years worth of things that Donald Trump retweeted. So the things on Twitter that he was seeing in his stream that he agreed with, that he liked, that he endorsed and sent out, where is this information going? It's probably not surprising Breitbart News is at the center of this because the CEO of his campaign, Steve Bannon, who's now his, his chief uh, political advisor in the White House and sitting on our National Intelligence Council, is the publisher of this particular organization, which has extremely right-leaning views. So not, not a surprise there at all. But if you look around Newsmax, Fox News, Fox News is probably definitely right-leaning, but within the mainstream. But some of these others, um, particularly Newsmax, that is a, it's a different type of, of news feed than you would traditionally see. But this is where that, this is the filter bubble 
that the president of the United States, our current president, is living in. So knowing that is a helpful thing. Here, here is what is helping to shape his policy. And again, agree or disagree, um, for his supporters, this is a good thing. Right? He, he's getting information, he's reacting, he's changing the status quo. Um, I would, the, one, the one thing I would argue here is the lack of expertise here. He, the, he has access to material beyond. We all could build a filter bubble like this. Um, hopefully, he is going to be integrating in some additional resources from his uh, National Security Council that has access to information that we don't. All right, let's see here. So knowing that um, changes in news can change, um, change how we see the world, because I am going out to these sources, and more and more my news feed looks like what I am, I am uh, already thinking. It's like the more I click on things that I like, the more things I like are showing up in my feed, things I agree with. What does that mean for society? That's the next big question to wrestle, to wrestle with. And I would argue that what we have seen is we are seeing a radical redefinition of what community means. And it happens in a couple ways. We seem to be moving from geography to topical definitions of community. And what do I mean by that? It used to be I would define my neighborhood by the people who live around me. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm talking over the fence to my neighbor. We do that less now than we used to. And part of the reason why is because we all have associations around the world because of mediated technology <laughs> where we are talking to people from faraway places who see the world like us. Um, I have, how, how many of you have friends in faraway places that you haven't met but would consider them good friends? Yeah, I think we, most of us do now. That's a, that's a pretty radical departure. They, they are part of our community in ways that they wouldn't have been in the past. Um, I, there's a uh, philosophy professor who teaches at Creighton University. And 10 years ago, I bought some comic books from him on eBay. He was selling them for his uh, partner. And his partner's uh, ex, ex had some comics, and they were selling them. And I bought them, and we started talking about comic books. And I started talking, and uh, Tom Kiefer is his name. And we started talking, and I started selling him some comic books. And he got interested in comic books, and we started uh, selling comics back and forth, and pretty soon we stopped selling each other comic books, and we just started sending each other boxes of comic books. And I've known Tom for well over 10 years now. We send each other Christmas cards. Uh, he was one of the first pe people to email me when my dad passed away. Um, I consider him a good friend. I couldn't tell you what he looks like. I've never met him. Um, my daughter uh, gets a Christmas present from him every year. She thinks, Tom Kiefer's great. I love Tom Kiefer, she says. She's never met him either. And I think a lot of us have those experiences now. Tom's part of my community, but not in a way that we would have seen before the internet. We're also seeing a redefinition of words that used to be absolutely fundamental to our sense of community. Words like friends, followers, likes. Something I fight with my daughter about all the time. I have this friend, she says, and she launches into this. And I said, how well do you know this friend? Oh, we're acquaintances on Facebook. Yes, that's your acquaintance. Um, we, what friend means means something different. Um, to me, a friend is somebody who will come get me on the side of the road when I break down and I, it's the middle of a blizzard and I'm on top of a mountain. And it means that I will go do the same for that person. That's how I define friend. Um, that's very different than how Facebook defines friend. Um, same thing goes with followers. We follow this and we follow that. Followers used to be followers of political leaders or followers of religious figures. We're redefining the language that we use to describe community. And it's intentional. Places like Facebook, places like Twitter, recognize the power that's imbued in these words. And they co-opt that to build that sense of community online. So that's a shift as well. And what we have seen then in these kind of this, these new topically based um, communities is a return to tribalism. And how many have taken political science classes here? How many have taken sociology classes here? And so one of the things, that, the concepts that kind of went between those two, I, I took a lot of those classes when I was in college. And one of the things that, that I was always fascinated by was the concept of othering. We define who we are by who we aren't. And so we are always looking for another group. 
my group is this because we are not this. And this starts with what we call the state of nature in political science. In the state of nature, resources are abundant. There where there's few people and there's lots of fruit growing on the trees and we're all running around and there's nothing to fight about because we all have everything we need. Our basic needs are taken care of. But as soon as you introduce scarcity into the mix, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need that. That's when we start to band together with like-minded people, whatever connects us, whatever our group is compared to what the other group is. And so it could be skin color, it could be geography, it could be ethnicity, it could be religion. And we form tribes of people with like-minded interests. So it sounds great online, it's like I've put together this group of friends across the country that share my love of comic books and academia and journalism, and I've got these robust relationships with all of these people, but it does come at the expense of the fact that I've talked to my neighbor to my, to my south four or five times in the last three years. It's like, hey, how you doing? That's about as deep as our conversation has gotten. Again, it's just a, it's a different dynamic and it plays into that kind of lack of diversity that we have and how we stop talking to groups that aren't like us. Um, a couple of articles I'll send out to you, one by a, a writer named Dana Boyd for a publication called Points, called Why America is Self-Segregating. Looks at how we are forming these kinds of, of relationships. And she actually, there's a wonderful section there about freshmen in college. And she actually blames it, uh, uh, the self-segregation at, at your freshman year of college on, you've heard this before, mobile phone. The mobile phone changes the way going off to college is. It used to be we would cut the apron strings and we'd leave mom and dad behind and our high school friends behind and we'd go. And you would be paired at a university with a roommate from somewhere else in the country. And maybe somewhere else in the world. And you didn't know this person. You were stressed about this. This isn't an easy thing. This is an uncomfortable thing. You're going to be put into a tight living quarter with a person you don't know. Um, this sounds appalling and terrible, and it introduces you to diverse perspectives, and it teaches you to work in groups of people um, that are coming from other places and to develop this sense of this new community. That's why, that's why colleges have always done this. But now when you go, you have a phone that tethers you back to your old life. Mom's checking on you all the time. There's also a, a whole, uh, she uh, gets into uh, talking about the ability for uh, parents to be way up in your business when you're off in college in a way they didn't used to be. It used to be you went off and that's how you learned to be an adult. Now you're still checking in with mom when you know, you're at, at your kegger at your dorm. Doesn't quite connect, you know, compute the way that it used to. Another piece that I'll send out to you is by Robert Reich, who is a former labor secretary um, for both Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. Widely, widely regarded and considered by both political parties. Um, definitely left-leaning. Um, I wouldn't call him nonpartisan. He's definitely a Democrat, um, but so well respected by conservatives that he, that he served uh, for Republican presidents as well. And he wrote a wonderful piece in Slate Magazine a couple years ago about the dangers of tribalism. And he said the two biggest tribes that we need to worry about in this country are Republicans and Democrats and that all of the telltale signs of um, tribal warfare is already at play. We have warlords. We have the heads of the parties. We have our sacred cows that you, know, you can't touch. Um, for Democrats, it's cuts to entitlements. Uh, on the Republican side, you've got uh, things like uh, abortion. You've got certain issues that are so toxic that you can never, ever talk to the other side about. And he goes to and he breaks down all of the things that kind of go into traditional tribal warfare, and those things are at play. I have seen in my lifetime, I was, I was talking with Adam earlier today, um, I, I, was, I used to work for an organization called Humanities Washington, and uh, there was a gentleman there, his name was Tom, and I, I forget Tom's last name, but he was uh, married, married to Karen Monroe, uh, who used to be the wife of Ralph Monroe, who was the Republican Secretary of State I was talking about. And they were both longtime Republicans, and, and I was talking with Tom, and he always was talking about his friend Ron from his time back in Washington, D.C., and Tom was like this total salt-of-the-earth guy. It took me almost a year to realize that he was talking about his good friend Ronald Reagan. And that's how immersed in GOP politics that, that they were. The wife of a Washington State Secretary of State, who was a Republican, and a, a formal aide to 
Ronald Reagan. They had both left the Republican Party about 10 years ago, and they said the reason why they had done that is there are no damn grown-ups left in the party. He said the way it used to be in D.C. is you had one group, the Republicans, who believed in small government, uh, who believed uh, in individual liberty, but had the best values of Americans in mind, the, the well-being of the democracy as a whole at their heart. And you had Democrats who believed in big government, a progressive social net, and had at their heart the best interests of the American democracy. And the two would bicker terribly during the day, and they would fight over the specifics of policy, and then they were friends, and they respected one another, and they went out for beers after work. And the next day they would come to work, and they would reach across the aisle, and they would compromise, and they would come up with policy that served the well-being of this nation. Now we see things like the nuclear option, where the majority party is not going to listen to the minority party. The Republicans are considering it right now, but the precedent was set by the Democrats during the Obama administration. It was considered by the Democrats because the Republicans were refusing to set or seat any of Obama's judges. Both sides are guilty. And the biggest issue at the kind of the soul of the Democratic Party right now that they're arguing with, how obstructionist do they want to be? We've seen eight years of terrible obstructionist politics from the right. Does the left want to respond? And right now we're seeing that in the protests on the streets. We had a huge march in New York to Chuck Schumer's house saying, we want you to fight tooth and nail. Do not give Donald Trump anything he wants. We want you to shut this government down. Does that have the best interests of the country at heart? That's the question that you need to keep coming back to. So if our society is kind of split into these really divisive camps, the last question that I want to leave you with is, what is the answer? And in my notes, it literally says, I have no freaking idea. But talks like this, bringing groups of people together and wrestling with these issues is really the first step. And this, to me, I was, I was honored to be asked to come and do this talk for the Honor Symposium because what happened in this most recent election, election, again, regardless of who you voted for or who you supported, was different than what we've had before. The administration that's in office is different. The resistance to that administration is different. I don't know the path forward. Now, I do know that if you would have asked me last year, hell, even a quarter ago, what I thought the answer was, I would have said media literacy. The ability to go out and vet your own information, to question the knowledge, to grapple with knowledge on your own was the key. But the last article I'll send out to everybody is a piece that's a longtime supporter of media literacy writing again for points. Um, and uh, her name is uh, Dana Boyd. And Dana Boyd wrote, a longtime supporter of media literacy, she asked the question, has media literacy failed? And as I was reading this piece, um, it really got me to question, because if, if, if I am going to a news source that I think is delivering facts to me, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the extremist, you know, it, uh, you know, some of the stuff that was produced in Russia and put up in blogs that was reposted as, as real news. That I think we can label, we can figure out, we can get to that. But when Fox News puts something up or MSNBC puts something up says, at these political extremes, how do you wrestle with that if you believe that is fact? When the President of the United States keeps dismissing CNN as fake news, CNN is not fake news. Agree or disagree uh, politically with whoever you want, but CNN is a reputable news organization. They are not fake news. So I, I've got to wrestle with this more um, because we have got to figure out a way but I do know at the end of the day, it's going to be groups of people like the people in this room wrestling this with issues um, that will lead this democracy into the next century. So with that, any questions from the group? We've got just a minute or two left. Anybody go once? Yeah. I just have a question about your view, right? Like, uh -huh. can I take, like, the most important thing that you brought into this? Uh-huh. Um, the wrong informations, right, that we did earlier with the program, mm -hmm. for example, that Obama was born in Kenya. Do you think that maybe also through the um, effect of the filter bubble, it gets worse every year because people do not just like want to believe something, but right. also that, that they get like this filtered information yep. makes them stronger in this belief, uh, yep. in believing that, yep. and then also the right wing media that came up with the article you said, that this also gets into that even more because, right, let's say you're a Democrat, right? Yep. And there's an article which is very favorable for Democrats, mm -hmm. really bad for Republicans, right? Yep. And then you have this 
talked about where you have your group position. Yep. You have everything that's just like it's more into it, so we can become like more extreme in your view, right. and we don't want to consider it anywhere else anymore. Mm. Which pretty much then also relates back to our topic, right? Finding middle ground. Yep. So that's so our conclusion is pretty much the filter bubble plays into that. Yep. That we can't find middle ground anymore. It is, it is getting increasingly difficult. Yeah, no, it, 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 I've, I was a journalist for 20 years, and it used to be the bulk of people that we were serving were you know, somewhere in here. And we, we'd hear from I, I worked at a newspaper called the Winnipeg World in Eastern Washington. And pretty regularly, I would get phone calls from people who thought we were a right wing propaganda rag and a left wing propaganda rag. And I always said, we're doing our job well if both the extremes are pissed off at us. That, that's a good thing to me, because it means we're serving that middle, we're getting people talking. Um, but you know, we, are, we are much more divided than we've ever been, and that, that path back. Um, one, one quick story that, that the, we as the middle, people who are in the middle of the mainstream political uh, uh, spectrum, have a tendency to be led by people on the extremes. And an example I always use with that is when I was, in, I was an editorial cartoonist when I was at Winnipeg. Um, and on Sunday night, I would, do my, I would do one cartoon a week, and I would do it on Sundays. And one of the things I would do is I, I had several pretty far left blogs and far right blogs that I would go to every Sunday night. And whatever they were talking about on Sunday or really charged up and fired up about, by Tuesday or Wednesday, those issues percolated up to the mainstream. So I would do my cartoon on that topic and everybody was always by Tuesday or Wednesday like, wow, Andy, you're, the, you're like the smartest guy because you knew this was coming up. I knew that the people who are most passionate were driving the debate on both sides. And, that was, and all of a sudden the middle was like, oh, hey, what's going on over there? Um, also, there is a natural human tendency. We put value in standing by the things that we believe in. And so if I believe passionately, it's like, it's like for instance, I am a First Amendment absolutist. As a, a lifelong journalist, I believe the First Amendment is absolutely sacrosanct. Um, do I think that you have responsibilities that come along with this and there are things you shouldn't say? Absolutely. But I think the government should make absolutely no laws against the First Amendment. It would take an incredible preponderance of evidence presented to me to change from that doesn't mean that I shouldn't continue to consider that, though, reevaluate. One other, one other notion is that we, we have a tendency, once we stop agreeing on facts, it's like, here's a body of facts. We can argue about our interpretation of that, but once we start getting to different sets of facts, it becomes much harder. There are people in this room who read the Bible or read the Quran, and it's a book of facts. And there are other people in here where that, that is a book of stories, it's mythology. And if I'm arguing with somebody and all of a sudden, I, my, myself, I would consider myself to be agnostic. So if somebody all of a sudden, we're having a, a good spirited debate, and then all of a sudden they start quoting Bible scripture as fact to me, we no longer are having an argument that's going to go to any kind of consensus. So yeah, there are huge, huge challenges. So great, great question. Yes? Could you see the rise of the traditional media again? You know, I, I am hoping, the one, I, I do know that my immediate response to what I've seen the last two weeks is I now am a paid subscriber to nine publications. I've always been a paid subscriber to multiple publications, but it's like, I'm, every month it's like, okay, I'm New York Times, you get some more money, and um, you know, Washington Post, you're getting some more money. I think we have to find a way to fund journalism, um, traditional journalism, where there is not, where the journalist doesn't have a market-driven reason to be in the game, that they are there to seek the truth and have the greater good of democracy. And so that, I'm hopeful. Uh, I do know that every single email that I've uh, seen the Seattle Times send, send out over the last few months now is very prominently at the top saying, this isn't free. We're giving it to you for free, but this is expensive to produce. If you, if you value this, we need your support. I will be fascinated. The, the uh, Pew Research Center does a state of the news media report that comes out May or June of every year. I always update my intro to mass media class with the latest. I'm hopeful that circulation numbers will actually see a bump this year. That, that, fingers crossed. So, thank you everybody for coming out today. I appreciate it. <laughs>